I really enjoyed the session and I'm a structural engineer, so that says a lot, but I mean, it was great to see this big picture and even the details as well. Uh, my questions for the first presenter, uh, I'm very impressed with the model. I love it every time you said physics-based, you know, that, that means a lot to a lot of us. Uh, very impressed with what, what's going on in the Boston area, extending this to New Hampshire, extending this to Maine. Are you aware, is there a concerted effort to do this, you know, on the East Coast, on both coasts. I mean, there are all kinds of cities subject to this, right? Baltimore, Philadelphia, work your way down. Uh, is there, a, is there a, a federal coordinating effort here? It just seems so important that we do this. So what are your, what's your take on that? Do you have any information? Yeah, there's certainly a concerted effort by us. <laughs> right. To try to expand that and, and do more. Um, we have done a, quite a bit in Florida as well. Texas is another place we've been working. Uh, the Pacific Coast, there's been a fair amount done in California, a little bit different program. Um, we've been operating in kind of state level, which seems to be a lot of interest state by state. Um, federal coordination is just kind of starting. So it's happening from my perspective to the Army Corps. Uh, so the Army Corps has a model you might be familiar with, with the North Atlantic Coast. Of the North Max and the North Atlantic Coastal Comprehensive Study, which is a, is a model that basically redid the tidal flood profiles. We're in communication with them. We were actually on their review committee for that model. They were on our review committee for our model. And I think they're really close to the same boy. We really just need to take what you guys are doing for the future and, and apply that across at least the Gulf and North Atlantic and or Gulf and Atlantic. Um, so we'll see where that goes. So it, it is starting to, to occur. Yes. Thanks. Um, for another question, kind of all that same vein, um, is FEMA using your data? Yeah, really good question. The zone Bs and all the different coastal. Yeah, so that's probably the thing that we run into most, right? People want to compare the FEMA model, time model, and they're, they're, they're really not comparable. Um, because of, of the purposes, because of what's been done, we, we actually do a lot of FEMA review and remapping. They're not there yet. Uh, we've talked to a lot of different insurance industries. They're, they're starting to trend that way. I think there's a lot of benefit to thinking that way. Um, but currently, FEMA is still stuck in kind of the present day historical analysis mode. If I could add to that, yeah, uh, I'm on a scientific resolution panel for FEMA. So, in the community and the FEMA contracts or FEMA have what they disagree with. That's what the SRP stepped in. And uh, what's been frustrating is uh, by the language that enables FEMA to do what they do, they're not allowed to look at climate change. <laughs> Uh, another question for Kurt. Um, so you showed data for Boston. So if a city like Miami or New Orleans wanted you to do that for them, what kind of input data do you need? Do you need detailed maps and elevation maps? And then once you have that information, how long would it take you to do to map something for Miami or New Orleans? Yeah, so I'll start with the end of your question, which is how long does it take? So Boston, that project, which was a, you know kind of the pilot site, took about a year and a half to, to complete. The state of Massachusetts, which is pretty big, took about two, two and a half years to complete. Um, so on a city level scale, I'd say it'd probably take about a year. Um, we're pretty well set up now since... <laughs> You know, initially we had to develop the entire model, which was basically the entire Atlantic Ocean, Gulf of Mexico. It's all it's all in there. If I showed you the whole thing, now what we do is we just go like we just did Palm Beach recently, Florida. We can just go in and detail that particular location and then run the model because we're looking at physics-based overland flow of these processes, um, including which which. I, I'm always talking to Tom about is, is the watershed based integration. So we do, it does have integration of discharge down rivers, which we can change temporally and it, it, it's part of the overall mix. 
what data we need. I mean, the foundational data, which is really, really important, is always topography and lithometry information. So that elevational data at high resolution. Um, most of the U.S. has pretty readily available information through LIDAR-based surveys, which, which helps us a lot. We usually do a lot of ground truthing. We did in Boston with site-specific information. And then any kind of calibration validation information that's available on water levels during event-based long-term information, we usually have tied information, is another key component that goes into to, to models. But we've got it to a point now where we can roll through it pretty well. So, Joe in the back of the room. Uh, two questions for you, Bob. Um, I enjoy your presentation. Um, so I presume your analysis assume that the um, green infrastructure is well maintained. Are there issues with maintaining the infrastructure? Um, yes, and in this particular watershed, uh, the Department of Public Works was very good at it. Um, I, I'll, I'll give you one anecdote. Um, one of the very first um, fire, ten fire retention systems we built there, what's your question is on the mark. It's maintenance, it's all about maintenance. Um, so we built a fire retention system, and because of the neighbor it was next to, even though it was all on city property, the neighbor had a very manicured yard, and so the city put in a nice little garden. And in the fall of that first year, the DPW uh, director called uh, James Gould, who's now the director of um, the Stormwater Center. How the hell do I maintain this system? And so Jamie met him out there at 4 p.m. on a Friday and took um, uh, some cutting shears and a rake and in half an hour cut everything above the ground, raked it up, and put it in the back of his pickup truck. And James said, do that twice a year, fall and spring. And the DPW director looked at Jamie and said, we don't do gardening, which was a lesson for us as an engineers and stormwater center. We should have brought in the people who did maintenance from the get-go, and we didn't. And, at, and since then, we always do. So Jamie said, well, what do you do? And he said, we cut grass. And so the next fire retention we built on Horn Street by the elementary school, we planted in just a conservation mix. And now, once a week, a pickup truck with a trailer and a garden tractor pulls up to it, takes about 10, 15 minutes to mow, and, you know, five, 10 minutes for him to uh, unpack and pack all the equipment. Uh, but they do that, you know, maybe 20 times a year. Seven times the amount of maintenance it would cost to just cut and make up stuff. But to them, that's not maintenance. So it was a valuable lesson for us. Every system after that, we had the people who do the maintenance come in. And actually, they were key in doing that, how we did, did the design of some of these gravel filters that are put in roadways, which are really useful for transportation um, installation. So a long-winded answer, yes, they are all being maintained because it's a very good uh, town uh, to work with. And a second quick question, if you don't mind. Um, I didn't quite understand why you posed your question as either, um, maybe I didn't understand it well, but either uh, impervious surfaces or climate change. Aren't they happening both at the same time? Um, that, that's, that's a fair, fair comment. Um, so the, I think the first part of that question that we asked was, which is giving us the most dramatic consequences? Uh, we did look at uh, how does climate change affect the hydrology on conventional infrastructure, and how does the green solar infrastructure react on the climate change as well? And um, this question was answered in, in what we were doing. The interesting aspect about climate change regionally, as far as precipitation goes, is we know the extremes are getting worse, but the center of the distribution hasn't shifted that much. So the average daily rainfall hasn't shifted that much. And so uh, green stormwater infrastructure it is keeping up with what we see climate change doing. And, and again, the, the main focal aspect of green stormwater infrastructure was the common events and the pollutant load that came with them attended with the first plus phenomena, which isn't as dramatic as it used to, as we thought it was. 
And so by capturing that first inch or even the first half inch, you do an incredible improvement in water quality. So uh, in that regards, uh, climate change and very smaller infrastructure hasn't seen that much of a dramatic change switch. We're going to switch to an online festival back. Um, I think this is more for the park. This is from Ken Cavern. Uh, is it possible to build a floating bridge? So, if anybody else wants to comment on that as well, with your knowledge of that, what use of that in the US would be great. Uh, well, that's a, an interesting question. Um, is it possible? I, I suppose it is. Um, I mean, I'm not a bridge engineer, so I can't really say much about what it would actually take to do that. Um, uh if the question is was something like that considered in this case i guess the answer is no um uh there you know if you start to look at future scenarios and um you know depending on kind of like uh, Kirk was talking about the different uh you know risk levels and so on and projecting that into the future um you know the idea of like viaduct starts to come into play a little bit um, and I think, you know, in a case where you're crossing along, you have a, you have a causeway now, but, you know, raising it is really problematic. And, you know, so potentially, I guess you could think about more of a causeway type structure. I mean, uh, uh, a uh, object bridge. Um, but yeah, that, that wasn't uh, part of the discussion on, on the I'll just, I'll just jump in and add a couple thoughts to that. So, We've had many cases where the bridge, you know, from a resilience perspective or from a climate change perspective, you know, would tell you to like, maybe you need to go a little higher, but the problem usually is the approaches and the surrounding connections and communities, driveways, all those types of things then also have to be changed. Um, we've worked a lot with flexible type bridge designs. So things like oversizing the columns, the piles, the support of nature, so that in the future, if you needed to add an increased deck, you could do that and you wouldn't have to change the whole substructure of the bridge. We haven't seen anything floating yet. That's a, like more of a permanent structure um, because that those approaches and the flexibility needed in the approaches just didn't work, so. Back to audience, ma'am. Uh, Mary Ann Hayes from Maine DOT, and I think my question is initially to Kirk, but I'd like to hear from anyone, and that's in your experience of people using the data, are they considering when they raise something, it's going to shove the water somewhere else, and what are the impacts on moving it? And second, is anybody um, doing any of the hard retreat uh, level decision making and recognizing whether it's uh, keeping traffic moving in Woolwich or what Victoria brought up yesterday morning about the short term keeping things going versus we should be looking it, it, is anybody actually um, abandoning anywhere and figuring out how to pay any reparations? Yeah, so in terms of how flood water is redirected, yeah, we do that all the time. In fact, we have at least 50 projects that we've done where the, there's some proposal being put in place and they want to know the redirection of flood water it's not just in terms of the extent or depth of flooding but also velocity changes in that i will tell you that in coastal communities where the water body that, that's the source of the flooding is large it usually doesn't matter meaning it's a drop in the bucket the amount of water that comes to land pushed back into the harbor of the ocean doesn't raise the ocean that would flood somewhere else if you go up estuaries <laughs> Or rivers, it becomes more of a concern because your water that you're keeping from the floodplain may, in fact, be redirected or, or cause an increase in the smaller water body. So it's, it's regularly looked at. It's built into everything that's been done in Massachusetts with, with the data that's been, a, been a applied. Um, in terms of your second question was... Is anybody going with abandoned retreat? Yeah, so a couple examples I showed were exactly that. So that surf drive... In, in Falmouth is a complete planned abandonment retreat approach. So it's a coastal road that services pretty important beaches right now, also has houses along the barrier beach. Um, and it's a flexible approach that is trying to maintain usage as long as feasible, monitoring what's actually happening with storms and sea level rise because there's uncertainty with this stuff, right? As you go forward, there's big uncertainties. So we never push people like, you know, well, it's going to happen, right? 
We're very much like flexible adaptation design. So that particular case, they're maintaining usage for as long as they can. There's a trigger point that's been established with return period levels and sea level rise that they then would then start to abandon and retreat that particular transportation corridor. Um, and the planning for that starts now, right? So they're, they're maintaining it. And Tucket is another one. They originally went in and they were going to raise the road. And we said, cost really didn't dictate that. And so we built that short front landscape that had ecological and community benefits at the same time, provided protections for the corridor when it was actually cheaper. And then again, built them time to relocate that road or redirect the road to the, the basically the one further back that I think they're eventually going to have to do if sea level rise goes as projected. So there have been some hard questions that are starting to be asked away. Now I have other cases where they don't do that, where they're like, hey, the bridge is this, we need to replace the bridge, we have to do it now, I'm not gonna raise it at all. And you're telling me it's probably 10 years from now, it's gonna be in trouble, they already have trouble there now, they know it, but they just can't abandon the road, they can't get through the community process to, to do that. So it, it's here and there is differences. That's our thoughts on that. Yeah, I guess I'd just say from you know uh, a little bit from DOT standpoint, I mean certainly the issue of you know where water might go is is on people's mind when they're looking at a project and and uh, you know looking at alternatives. Um, you know, I think what I think we're looking forward to is you know as we develop the, uh, the well, as we develop the model that you know Kirk was talking about, um, you know having that kind of a tool and and the. Uh, you know, the information that goes along with that will certainly help those kind of evaluations and analyses, you know, going forward. Um, as far as the whole abandonment piece, I mean, I, right now, DOT's, you know, we're not touching that. I mean, that's, you know, that's a decision that other folks will have to make. And, you know, we respond accordingly, I guess. But DOT's not going to make a decision about, okay, yeah, we're going to, you know, we see the future and you know water levels are going to be at, at a certain level and therefore you know we're going to make a you know a decision to advance i think that's those are decisions that um you know the department will probably wrestle with in the future but right now it's it's not uh not something that's you know we're going to, we're going to do okay that brings us to uh 10 30. um so if you do have additional questions please grab our wonderful palace we're going to give one more round of applause to you right now.